I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Brie to like musical theater. How are you two doing today? I am on the top of the world right now. Oh gosh, tell me more. Um, I got uh, 5,000 Texas Longhorns in my secret hideout. <laughs> um, I just got paid for them, and honestly, I don't think there's anything that could stop me at this point. I'm just, you know, I'm feeling good. I, I could, uh, I could yodel um, about this. I, I know this is a spoiler for later, but are you planning to overthrow the capital with all these cattle? Yeah, or are you just planning to murder we, them? I mean, I'm just feeling we we Jan six it, baby, with all these cows. <laughs> Damn. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't. He see- really is feeling on top of the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't see how you could have picked up what we were throwing down here, but if you have, (laughs) this week we are talking about the Walt Disney animated feature, Home on the Range. Cue the music. was written and directed by Will Finn and John Sanford, with music and lyrics by Alan Menken and Glenn Slater. It premiered on April 2nd, 2004. On its opening box office weekend, Home in the Range grossed about $14 million in box office estimates, opening fourth behind Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed, Walking Tall, and Hellboy. Following the disappointing box office weekend... The great lineup. I mean... <laughs> I don't even know what Walking you Tall wanna... is. The other two I can say are quality. You guys want to do a, a double double feature? Honestly, here? Hellboy and Scooby Doo Two. Hellboy's great. Good. That's a good double feature. Oh yeah, that's like a Halloween double yeah. feature. You could. It do looks that. like Walking Tall was a movie with um, The Rock. Wow, that that was Dwayne The Rock Johnson was in Walking Sh- Tall. Sh- or Black mm-hmm. Adam himself. Mm-hmm. All right. We, 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 we... Um, Following the disappointing (laughs) box office weekend, financial analysts predicted that Disney would be forced to have a write-down of the production cost, which totaled more than $100 million. Following the latter release of The Alamo, which also met four box office returns, it was reported that Disney would have to write down $70 million. The film ended its box office run with $50 million in domestic earnings and $145.5 million earned worldwide, Um, which is a little disappointing as far as Disney goes, even at the time. Um, But the plot of Home on the Range is when a greedy outlaw schemes to take possession over the patch of heaven dairy farm three determined cows a karate kicking stallion and a colorful corral of critters join forces to save their home the stakes are sky high as this unlikely animal alliance risks their hides and match wits with a mysterious band of bad guys so andrew you're the reason why we're here today i guess i am i'm sorry about that I've been diving into the rabbit hole, and the more I peel back on this on this onion of Home on the Range, the more fascinating it is. Yeah. So, I mean, I got in on layer one, which is uh, the, the bad guy is a yodeling man, which he sings an amazing Disney song. Maybe the best Disney song ever written. Even, even as far as Alan Menken's other work goes, it, it's a pretty good Disney song. It's a it banger. Is. It's an like, absolute Not even bop. just as a song, like <laughs> as a scene, as an execution of an idea, it is fantastic. Yeah. I like it's the best part of the whole movie by um by a lot. Like it's not even close, sadly. Um and that's where I got in, and then I watched the whole movie and <laughs> oops, I watched the whole thing and it wasn't good. You didn't like it. Okay. <laughs> Because I... No, I'm not a fan. It's not funny. I mean... So, like, okay, it's animated fine. It, it has the... It's the um Emperor's New Groove kind of look. I think look, it looks beautiful, you know? sincerely. Like, it looks... I was expect. Maybe it's just because my expectations were so low. I think this is better than a lot of the other films that came out around the time. I think this is better than Brother Bear. Um, I think this is... <laughs> Maybe. A lot better than those. They're close. They're close for sure. Neck and neck. It's better than The Wild. Okay, it's definitely better than The Wild. The Wild is like that ugly CGI, yeah, isn't it? It's better it? than Teacher's Pet. It's better than a lot. Valiant, Chicken Little. There are so many worse films that were coming out around this time. I feel like this one just got shit it on. It did, though, unfairly. When it came out. And this, I don't this know has why. quality elements to it. I think it, it became a very easy target, undeservedly. 
in my opinion. I think the problem with it is, is it's short and it's not funny. It's gr- okay. Maybe it's just because we, we as a society of enjoying Disney watchers expected to be family entertainment. And it was children's entertainment, which is fine if you're seeing a Winnie the Pooh movie and all that. And 74 minutes is perfect children's entertainment length. Oh, yeah. I think. No, I mean, it's children. It could have been good at that length. It just it needed to be funny. I, it's engaging. Like it's a plot you can follow and characters you like and the colors are pretty and the animation is gorgeous and the songs, the songs are catchy. It's not Phil Collins songs playing over a scene and then expecting you to have an emotion. We have Bonnie Raitt. We have Katie Lang. We have some great vocalists. Yeah, can I point out though? There's a, like a bla- uh, a glaring flaw in the film, and I think Are I could get, describe it is in it two Rose, words. Roseanne Barr. Roseanne yeah. Barr. Yeah. Uh, she thought the bitch um, was white. <laughs> mm, that character. Wow, not funny. Main character as well. Main character of the film. Not funny. Yeah. Doesn't say even one thing that is funny in the entire movie. Nope. Um. Can't can't even <laughs> argue. There's. <laughs> Um, there's literally not even a single line that that character says that's like a chuckle. The thing is, <laughs> do you think it's her improvising in the booth, or do you think it's just um like her given lines and just saying it? Because we know that Roseanne isn't always the easiest person to work with, um, based on the the things that have come out about her since. And there's a lot of things that have come up about the these specific actors in this movie since. Yeah, but we'll we'll ignore them for now. For, <laughs> for now. now. Um, yeah, I think that she was probably reading the script and maybe in. Infer- Improvising some, maybe they wanted it to be there like are a, some an weird, Aladdin genie weirdly situation. Crass lines where she's saying that her utters are real. Yeah, and it kind of clashes with your concept that this is a children's and not a family well, film. Children aren't gonna think. It's almost anything like of they that. wanted it to be a yeah, but they wanted it to be a family film. It's just that all of the more adult jokes are not funny. So the only thing in the movie that's actually funny, like the funniest part of the movie, is the villain. There are moments of other characters, like when Steve Buscemi shows up. I really like what he does and i think he's got a few funny cracks um i think the goat i don't know why i think that's a cute joke i think that's a cute cute gag that's more of a kid's humor thing but i suppose it's not terrible it's definitely better than like roseanne Barr eats stuff and then burps (laughs) it's funny because cow fat yeah she she's big she's the biggest one yeah uh the um like when they run in, run into the Longhorns and and they harass them, um, that's that's hilarious. But they go to like the little burlesque show and they think that the the cows are the ladies and the ladies are the cows. Mm-hmm. Great gags. That that part's funny ish. <laughs> yeah. So the movie's not funny. To to kind of round it all out, the movie's not particularly I do... funny. <laughs> Before we get too deep into what the film is, um, we are starting a new segment, starting with this one. This is the wild facts. All right, the first wild fact. The title was not originally Home on the Range. It was originally a much better and much more fitting title called Sweating Bullets. However, the higher-ups at Disney decided against releasing a children's film with the word bullets in the title and forced them to change the name. Really? Like, bullet? Like, kids know what bullets are. They're all playing Call of Duty. <laughs> You're right. Can't fight logic there. Um, wild fact number two. <laughs> originally, the film had literal ghost riders in the sky stealing cattle, and the original protagonist was a young calf. That sounds fucking awesome it sounds much cooler though i will say if it wasn't alameda slim still i would be a little disappointed just because it's alameda slim but he's a ghost now yeah if it was that i'm good i'm I'm down and the young calf thing kind of um it makes it so roseanne Barr (laughs) cannot be the main character um (laughs) the most important wild fact here so i'm keeping it early but i think it's very important that you guys know this a deleted scene features slim's ultimate plan to use the captured cattle to march on washington dc and take over the white house sadly they decided the idea was too strange and unrealistic alameda slim is played by randy quaid yeah randy quaid noted (laughs) crazy person on the run from the government in canada could you imagine if that actually like happened in the movie and then happened on january 6th and (laughs) and randy quaid was there in his underwear like waving a flag (laughs) disney would have predicted the future it's true. It would have been like The Simpsons. Yeah. I, I mean, mm. honestly, I think that premise, I don't know why they removed it. That sounds amazing and a little too real. Imagine if that's the climax where these three cows are trying to stop Slim from going to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh no. Come on. Where do you even come up with these ideas? I like what were they? Oh, a writer's room, apparently. I mean, we need like the the capital cattle riots. Um but when the White House plan was scuttled, Slim's plan was changed to having the cows sold for slaughter. Disney had an eye on the McDonald's promotion and didn't want kids making the connection. So the fate of the cows is left ambiguous. The only reference left in the film is the line, don't want to be late for that big roundup in the sky. You know, a lot of kids, when they find out that burgers are made of cows, they actually stop eating meat. Yeah, and you don't. It's actually important for McDonald's to keep this a secret. Yeah. How (laughs) else are they supposed to sell the toys based on Home on the Range? So the co-director, Will Finn, who doesn't think much of the film itself, does think it really deserves, doesn't really deserve the heat it gets and claims that the production was no nowhere near as bad as his experience on directing films like The Road to El Dorado, which was a heated disaster behind the scenes. I think that movie is very good, though, but I can imagine... Road to El Dorado is a lot better than Home on the Range. I think that they're of comparable value for their target audience, where El Dorado is for an older children adult audience, and this is for a younger children adult audience. I think you're you're being quite rude to El Dorado by comparing it. Have to you Home watched it Ring. recently? It's not even close. I have. It's, it's a little good. uneven. It's definitely uneven, but it's much better than this. Um. <laughs> so the animator Chris Buck, who would go on to be the co-director of Frozen and is the co-director of Tarzan, looks back at this film like dis- with disgust. When asked about it at a Q&A session, he expressed strong disappointment at the change of the original Sweating Bullets concept during development recalling the experience of animating on the film, which he summed up as spending two years listening to Jennifer Tilly's voice and animating her as a cow as a low point in his career. (laughs) I mean, that is literally what he was doing, I'm sure. I like Jennifer Tilly's voice, though. (laughs) Would you want to animate her as a cow? You know, if I didn't know that might be a possibility, I don't think I would have gotten into animation. And I especially wouldn't bitch about it at a QA. I would. You'd bitch about most things, though. I think I think animators should complain about everything all the time because they are treated like shit that one i will give you they are very badly treated (laughs) i watched the frozen documentary and seeing how much work all those animators had to put into everything it's really really scary um how little they get paid and how much they're sleeping in their offices to get their deadlines yeah no this like this thing in a lot of industries i think where there's like um the one group of people that has the ideas, yeah. you know, and then there's the other group of people that actually does everything. Um, and for some reason, the group of people that actually does everything is always uh, treated like absolute garbage. It's like uh, programmers in, in uh, every industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. The last wild facts and the, then play the wild facts sound. Um <laughs> The movie was one of several 2004 bombs that mixed together with Roy E. Disney's second Save Disney campaign and general turmoil at the Walt Disney Company to bring CEO Michael Eisner's 21-year-long reign to an end. Eisner was forced out the year after this film's release to allow President Bob Iger to keep Pixar in their family, whose staff and films would indeed help Disney recover from the flops of this year. Do you think Lion King one and a half was a flop? It's a direct Disney movie, and I think it did well for what it was. I liked it. I had it <laughs> I on VHS. Think, I had it on DVD. Rude. <laughs> so, and I guess maybe there wasn't anything. Part of me always thought that the rabbit was like the secret main character and should have been like the lead. <laughs> Okay, elaborate. I mean, the so idea they, of a lucky rabbit with a missing foot is funny. Yeah, and like, I don't know, the movie opens on him. He's like the narrator, kind of, not really. And then he just shows up later and he he has actually like no connection to any of the characters and he's just involved in the plot. Um, And I don't know, I watched this movie a lot as a kid, like way too much. Like I had it, we had, a uh, you know, those car DVD players. Yeah, we had those and I had basically two DVDs for it. It was Shark Tale and this. Um, Oh, two high quality films you got there. Honestly, this is significantly better than Shark Tale. I will agree. Shark Tale is is bottom of the barrel. That's actually complete garbage this at least has some like okay stuff um this movie isn't thought... an eyesore at all this this movie's good to look at yeah it's that and the, some of the songs are like okay and i'd say almost all the songs funny. are good the yodeling guy's fun um just anytime that you're watching the main characters you're like oh it's this movie <laughs> <laughs> i wish the villain was the main character i wish the rabbit was the main character the the rabbit i don't know i just always felt like the rabbit should have had more of a role um i also had the video game for this on game boy um 
and in that okay, you play... Okay, please describe the video game in as much as you can. Uh, there's, like, different levels that you play, and you'll play as different characters, I think. Um, I believe you can play as the rabbit and the horse, and in the horse levels, you would, like, karate kick people. Um, yeah, I never got very far, because I wasn't very good at it, but that's that's what I remember. Um, but I don't know. I always felt like the rabbit should have had more of a role in the movie, and just kind of doesn't. I guess. Um, but there are moments I love in this movie. Like, there are... I specifically love, like, the... the the bull bouncer that only lets in cows. I think he's probably my favorite character. There's like many characters that I am in love with kind of in the way of the good dinosaur or that movie. I don't like, I love moments in it very much. I think this, the, the fundamental flaw in this movie is that every character is likable except for the, the leads. Well, do you want to talk about just, our three leads? Yeah, well, let's, let's go for it. We've already talked about Roseanne, Maggie. who is just basically playing Roseanne as a cow. Um, but Maggie's thing is that she is a award-winning cow who's just very big. Show cow, yeah. Yeah, and she gets... Okay, it, it, here's one thing with the with her that I just... is just baffling to me, right? She has... she she gets attacked by Alameda Slim like her cow, her farm does, and all of the cattle get taken, and she doesn't because right. she's in a barn, because she's a show cow. And then she is given to Patch of Heaven and is and they decide they're going to try to go get money. They're going to go to the fair or something. And then they later decide to be bounty hunters against Alameda Slim. But she never, like, mentions that she has a beef with Alameda Slim until, like, much later, like when they first meet him, it's like it's weird. It feels like a scene got <laughs> deleted. Yeah, it's like she's like, Oh, we could go after Alameda Slim. Like, look at his bounty's perfect. Like, and it's it almost seems like she just wants to do it for the bounty. And then later on, we find out, Oh my god, she has this beef with him, and that's the real problem but like she did, there's no like hint at it or anything it's just it just feels like it's out of nowhere i don't i don't know also they reuse footage um when alameda slim uh is being like it is like a flashback to him taking over her farm um and they reuse footage from his music number just in that <laughs> flashback they're just using shots from the music number mean from the opening scene uh the opening scene and the flashback that she does when they're walking past gotcha, the uh gotcha gotcha in both of those they're just using footage from the from the music number that he has so do you think that that opening scene was something that didn't always exist on Twitter? i think that this whole freaking movie is an absolute mess and i'm sure there's tons of stuff that didn't used to exist i'm sure <laughs> that they tried the rumor is like they had a much edgier film once upon a time that the studio made them dumb down to be a film for toddler age kids yeah. And you can kind of feel where there was intended edge and then it got sawed away by higher ups and a lot of other folks that don't quite know what they're doing. Didn't didn't Eisner like his whole thing was that he wanted to appeal to like teenagers, though? Yeah. Why would he have them dumb this down to like a kid age? Well, the thing about Eisner is he wanted to he wanted the parks to be for teenagers for sure. He wanted or... to get the boys was Eisner's big thing. Eisner mm -hmm. wanted to get the boys, and he also was very big on cutting prices no matter what. He, which is why we, in the mid-2000s, we got all those wonderful Disney Channel movie movies, like the Lizzie McGuire movie and Princess Diary, and things that we look back with nostalgia on because they are kind of nostalgia cheese, but only existed to try to make cheap movies that would make a lot of money. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. So Regardless. that's also the big reason why um, we got a lot of, like, do you remember Teacher's Pet? I remember it, but I never watched it. Do you remember? I do know what you're, you're talking about. Like, that's why in the late 2000s, or sorry, early 2000s, late 90s, we got like more boy centric animated films like Treasure Planet, Atlantis, Tarzan, even to an extent. Um, some of those were actually good too, but um, not well remembered, I guess. Not well remembered, um, not well loved, but the big ones to bring up your favorite person doug's first movie the um dinosaur recess schools out return to neverland cheap movies that they could throw onto a big screen yeah um not a great time for disney no um <laughs> probably one of their worst times um and it really did not start looking up for them until uh the princess and the frog <clears throat> where they really started turning things around. But they still had leftover pieces like Mars Needs Moms from their deal with Robert Zemeckis and Nomeo and Juliet. That was a Disney one? It is technically a Disney... 
Pictures with Stars Animation and Rocket Pictures. Yeah. Okay. Where were we? We were talking about Maggie. Um, do you have anything more to say about Maggie? I feel like we... No, but I do want to talk about the other two cows, which is Miss yeah. Calloway, played by Judy Dench, and Grace by Jennifer Tilly, who I almost prefer them as a two-hander. Like, if we had just not had the Roseanne Barr side effect and we put Buck in the place of Roseanne Barr, because I feel like Buck does a lot of the narrative work there, too. Yeah, but then you wouldn't have the side plot where he's he wants to be the bounty hunters guy. Even though that, that side plot goes nowhere. It's literally just a dead end. It's, uh, I don't know. Okay, so those two, Miss Calloway, her thing is that she gets mad when her hat falls down and she's very and she's british which is weird like for this formal, western british movie. yeah doesn't make sense um and the other one's thing is that she is uh tone deaf and a so little she's goofy immune. she's goofy and tone deaf so she's immune to the yodel hey uh, she has something to do you have the stick in mud they are they were trying to recreate the magic with hocus pocus you have the bet midler one you have the kathy and jimmy one and you have the sarah jessica parker one yeah but they failed because they didn't do it very good <laughs> um i think their vocal performances they both jennifer tilly and judy dench do a very good job i mean nothing in top of judy dench did as old deuteronomy in the cats movie but maybe judy dench just shouldn't be animals <laughs> You know what? I don't often take advice you give, but that that's a good piece of advice that Judy Dench should take. Don't be animals. It's not a good decision. Bree, look up Judy Dench. Tell me <laughs> if she's ever been an animal and had it work. Um, Let's talk about Buck as played by a um, man who has been accused of many horrible things, Cuba Gooding Jr. Ah, uh, Buck's whole thing is that he wants to be a big hero and he wants to, he gets an opportunity by working for the bounty hunter. I don't remember the bounty hunter's name, Rico. Yeah. Rico, is it Rico? It's Rico. Yeah. Uh, Rico rejects him at first, so then he tries to do it solo and then gets reaccepted by Rico, except for, uh-oh, Rico is actually working for the bad guy. Uh, and that is the end of the plot line. They just kill Rico right there and uh the horse helps the cows he's um uh an interesting character i guess in that he's sort of an antagonist for some of the movie he i'd call him more like uh a nuisance more than an antagonist he is directly trying to make the the heroes fail because he wants to succeed himself yeah but he's more or less like a doof a, go a boob a, a buffoon yeah um yeah not a super important character probably could have done the whole movie without him but you gotta have some comic relief i guess in this movie where everyone is a comic relief have you guys ever heard of the movie dougal yes, yes. <laughs> okay i think that might be the only other time she was an animal you know okay, what judy, judy dench, dench should not be animals <laughs> <laughs> it's official judy dench cannot be animals anymore when she does it's okay. terrible she was Someone... in dougal i will say that and it yeah. also has a different name hold on wait she had a different name in dougal no the movie no, itself is called the magic roundabout yeah that yeah was... the magic roundabout is the british uh name so, okay so you okay. know we call it dougal because we don't know what roundabouts are in america no 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 <laughs> when all-around nice guy harvey weinstein bought that film for american distribution he redubbed it with an entire american cast because Brit Americans won't watch British things. Um, so like Kevin Smith True. dubbed a b moose. It's it's the shitty equivalent of that Polly Shore Pinocchio, where they had an entirely British made film and then they dubbed it with Polly Shore. <laughs> Which, that one looks fantastic. <laughs> Maybe we should do that one as a Patreon commentary one day. <laughs> she, yeah, so it looks like Dougal and Home on the Range and a film called The Bear. Did she play the titular The Bear? I don't know. Let me look. Um, Yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about the production because I have uncovered how this production laid out a little bit, if that interests you, Andrew. Yeah, sure. As long as we can talk about Alameda Slim right after. Oh, we will. You will. But the original... <laughs> came from director Mike Gabriel, who did not end up being the credited director, who really wanted to adapt Western legends such as Annie Oakley, Buffalo Bill, and Pecos Bill into animated films. He pitched both projects on the Gong Show meeting. Um, they were more interested in po Pocahontas, which went into production first. When Pocahontas was finished, he came back with his Western pitch, and he came out with an idea that might combine Captain Courageous with a Western. Gabriel then developed his concept into a 40-page fil film treatment, which was well-received by then-feature animation president Peter Schneider. Soon after the project, then titled Sweet Sweating Bullets, um, went into develop. The story originated as a supernatural Western about a timid cowboy who visits a ghost town and confronts an undead cattle hustler named Alameda Slim. 
It was then reconceived into a story about a little bull named Bullets that went, wanted to be more like the horses that led the herd. In 1999, in an attempt to salvage the production and retain the existing characters and background art, story artist Michael Labash suggested a different approach to the story that was, involved three cow protagonists who became bounty hunters to save the farm. Building on that idea, idea, fellow story artists Sam Levine, Mark Kennedy, Robert Lance, and Shirley Pierce developed a new storyline. However, in 2000s, Mike Gabriel and co-director Mike Giamo were removed from the project because of the persistent story problems. Returning to Disney feature animation after the Road to El Dorado, Will Finn, who was originally slated to be the supervising animator on Maggie, and John Sanford are brought on board to direct in October of 2000. Jess has like a conspiracy wall behind him with all the uh, Home on the Range lore. <laughs> It's just wild. It's like trying to figure out how did how did we get here? How did this happen? We went from Pecos Bill, Annie Oakley, boy in a ghost town full of ghosts, to three cow bounty hunters, to home on the range. Absolute disaster. Um, I guess this is what happens when something that is trapped in production hell gets claws out. its way <laughs> t- claws its way into our world. <laughs> And the thing is, I can not I'm not saying that the animators and directors didn't care. Obviously, you have to care a very big deal. I don't believe this is a passion project. It's kind of like when you get assigned a musical every week, Andrew. You're not putting your whole heart into it. You're showing up and doing your best and doing a job. I do my best. I watch Home on the Range for fun, and then Jess is like, let's talk about it. And I'm like, only if we could talk about Alameda Slim, and we're 35 minutes in, and I haven't gotten to do it yet. Well, let's talk about him. <laughs> I'm kidding though. Um, but Alameda Slim is the only reason to watch this movie. <laughs> I'd say the animation. I'm just gonna say too. it. I'm the just an- saying it straight. The animation in Alameda Slim scenes is the best though. It is. <laughs> and he is the best animated character in the movie. How much do you think is really Randy Quaid and how much do you think is dubbed? Okay, any time where he's singing or yodeling, it is not Randy Quaid. Are you sure? Sur- Are you certain of that? I'm positive. Okay. Randy Quaid can't sing or yodel. I think I saw him in something and he sang and I was like, okay, that's surprisingly not terrible. But continue. I don't think it's him. Um, Regardless, though, he is amazing. I would love to get like a some sort of spinoff or anything with Alameda Slim and his and his three boys. Uncle Slim, Uncle Slim. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I agree. <laughs> that entire scene is one of my favorites, too, where they're just chasing him through the mine and yelling Uncle Slim every, like, two seconds. <laughs> um, this character, he has... His motivations are um, completely unclear. Uh, he just wants to own all of the land to spite the... Uh, people who owned it before this this very unclear it doesn't make very much sense but he's really funny <laughs> he doesn't like it when when people say he sings because he's a yodeler uh his disguised name when he goes undercover is mr yodel mr yodel yeah 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 he, yeah he just really likes yodeling he's just he's just a fan <laughs> And he doesn't think yodeling is singing. It's an art. It's an art. He only has like two scenes in the movie. Like he actually isn't in it very much. Um, But he's what I remember the most about it, though. Like I literally, I remember more about him than I do about the cow characters that we are with for like 90% of the movie. But it's a 70 minute movie. (laughs) So even like two or three scenes, that's a good chunk of the movie. It's true. But he's in like 10 minutes, whereas like Roseanne is probably in like 50 minutes or more. So um i'm watching an interview with randy quaid about this and he's like i really didn't know what the character was i just kind of showed up and i I tried not to play it too scary and i tried not to play it too threat but i still want to be threatening (laughs) (laughs) i really i just i don't know the character design is great i love that his like the top half of his body is like andrew he looks like you Let's be clear. And then the bottom half of his body is tiny. Bree, look up Alameda Slim from Home on the Range. He, he does look a lot. He like looks me. exactly like you if you were tall. I don't know, but his like when you get to his legs, they turn in. It's like he's got tiny legs. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, that's like Tim Burton design. I see it. I definitely see the comparison. Honestly. You should cosplay as him. I you could would do, do a good cosplay. The, the problem with it, though, is I'd have to tell people, I'm Alameda Slim, and they'd be like, <laughs> who? They'd be like, oh, okay. You know, from and Home on the like, Range. From Home on the Range. And they're like, um, from from what? And the, the Disney movie with the cows? <laughs> <laughs> they would be like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, and then they'd yeah, walk away. Yeah, the, and they'd be like, what would the fuck be was I talking about? Right then? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> He just made that up. I know it. Randy Quaid. What is he talking about? (laughs) 
<laughs> um, on that note, it's time for our favorite segment of the show, where we compare our opinions to those of a literal verified Rotten Tomatoes reviewer. It's time for previews. It's time for previews. It's time for previews. And Bree, I'll take care of the review section. I figured. You just have to take care of the response section. <laughs> this Andrew knows where this is going. I have a feeling <laughs> that most of the audience Dude, knows where this is going. Dude, Jess does look like the nephews. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I do look like the nephews. I will play all three nephews. <laughs> Wait a second. Is this like we could actually do this? This is like the actual cosplay. And then Bree will play. Do I have to the... buy a bolo tie? <laughs> <laughs> that's the most. That's the thing you're worried about buying. I don't want to own a bolo tie. <laughs> <laughs> and Bree will play elite real life Katie Lang. All right. So Doug Walker of Channel Awesome said in January of 2012. Wait, who is this? Just clarify. For, I, who is this person? The, Doug Walker of Channel Awesome? I've never heard of this man. The Nostalgia Critic himself. Oh, the Nostalgia Critic. Doug Yancey that's a, Walker. That's a source right there, the Nostalgia Critic. I'm sure he's got something great to say about this. <laughs> oh, God, do I hate this film. This is right up there with the Aristocats. Just no creativity, no <laughs> spontaneity, no passion, no effort, just pure phoned inness. I'll tell you the story because really you can't figure it out pretty quickly if you're like you'll like this film or not. It's about as half-assed as you can imagine. Okay, <laughs> now let me make one thing clear. When I say half-assed, I mean half-assed for Disney. I know animation is hard. I know that by most normal standards, this is pretty good animation. And I know that by most fil bad films and even bad children's films considered that this isn't horrendous. But if somebody told you that this was from the greatest animation company in the entire world, admit it. You'd be a little cheesed off too you wouldn't <laughs> want to see more effort from something that's so massive and so large and this is a movie that's obviously just geared towards little kids i mean really little kids toddlers the jokes aren't for adults the writing isn't for adults these characters aren't for adults even the anim animation style isn't really for adults and again this is just was the magic with disney they hit both they could hit the, both the kids and the adults but here no it's just for kids the only thing i remember remotely laughing at was jennifer tilly as w this one cow and to be honest it's jennifer tilly she's always funny aside from that i remember so little the songs are forgettable the characters are forgettable the obnoxiousness about how bright and colorful and shiny this is. Ooh, it's like something out of Di Barney the Dinosaur or something. It just doesn't what? seem like Disney. Or maybe it does, what but not updated about? Disney. Not current Disney. Not the Disney that kept us coming back, wanting more. Not the passion, not the drive. Sigh. I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just bad. With a lot of these Disney films I was forced to watch this month, I came across a few surprises. Sadly, there was no surprise with this one at all, unless you're only for a few years old or younger. I'd say this is a definite skip. <laughs> so. Has he seen Emperor's New Groove? Because I feel like the animation like looks the same between like, this and Emperor's that. I think Emperor's New Groove looks a little This worse. might even be better animated. This is better animated than, than, yeah. than Emperor's New Groove. And I feel like it's a similar situation to Emperor's New Groove where they kind of had to remake this on the fly. The, the issue, the only real issue is that Emperor's New Groove is funny and this isn't well, funny. Well, they leaned into the humor for Emperor's New Groove and I feel like they leaned into the style and hypothetically emotional side for this. Yeah. Um. Jeez, he went hard though. Damn. Um. But much like the way... I appreciate it. I appreciate it. He, nostalgia critic, dove in there. He said what everyone was thinking. Jennifer Tilly, always funny. <laughs> yeah, um, huh Alameda Slim, I guess, doesn't exist in this movie. <laughs> Not hilarious. Um, no good the, songs. Doesn't like yeah, yodeling. Does, he doesn't appreciate the art. Doesn't appreciate fun. Um, <laughs> doesn't appreciate a good time. But much like we do, Andrew, the director of this film had some words to say about Mr. Doug Yancey, nostalgia critic Walker. <laughs> Um, Bree, how about you let us know what the director had to say? So the director, John Sanford, said in response, Yes, I love it when people live stream Home on the Range and tweet comments. Good or bad, it's fun. Except you, nostalgia critic. <laughs> you can go fuck yourself, you unfunny douche nozzle. <laughs> My issue was the incredibly abrasive tone of his reviews. And in particular, when he accused the crew of Home on the Range of laziness. Laziness. You could say what you want about the movie. It's deeply flawed. But our crew was anything but lazy. I won't stand for that. 
king shit. That okay, is some here's, king shit. Here's my actual thoughts uh, on this whole situation, though. Um, Doug Walker doesn't know how to criticize movies in any way. Um, we've, he we've doesn't have brought that up many times before. He doesn't have a critic bone in his body, and his go-to for everything is if the movie is something he didn't like, he says that it was half-assed or they didn't try or they didn't put any effort in. That's yeah. what he says like every single time, no matter what. So I agree with the director, but also I don't even think that that's an actual thought-out critique from the um, from Doug. I think that he just said that because that's what he always says. <laughs> um, I just find it so funny that someone took the time to say "fuck you" nostalgia critic specifically <laughs> you unfunny douche nozzle which is basically a summation of what we've been doing on this show for the last two years i don't know why it keeps coming up but it does he's just a funny guy to talk about it's a i don't funny know what guy to, to make fun of um yeah i i gotta agree i gotta hand it to him he he owned the nostalgia critic <laughs> um ratioed uh, take the L. I don't know. What do the kids say? Is that what they say? Yeah, something like that. Um, I just find it so funny that all roads lead back to Channel Awesome. <laughs> this is old drama, too. January of 2012. My goodness. A decade ago. <clears throat> Over a decade ago. We're digging up the good shit. Yeah. Um, for you guys. We do it for you. Yes, mm-hmm. we do. Um, I don't imagine we're going to have a ton to say about songs. We are going to do really, really quick letterbox game. Previews yeah. fast. Um, Bree against Andrew. You ready? Oh, I'm yeah. ready. All right, Letterbox game. I'm gonna read real Letterbox reviews, and Bree has to dis- Bree and Andrew have to decide whether or not they are one star, five star, just based on the review alone. All right, let's go, Andrew. You're first. Okay. The bad guy yodels. Five stars. That's a one star. Bree, you're next. Mm. Okay. Lesbian cows. Five star. That is correct. Yeah. Andrew, ready? Yes. Racism movie. Racism movie. Not, that's what it says. <laughs> Racism movie. Okay. Um, one star. I hope that is correct. Bree. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a crush on the horse. Bro. Oh. Okay. Um. <laughs> hmm. This is tricky. I'm gonna go one star. That is a five star, Andrew. Yep. Holy fuck. Holy fucking fuck. Five stars, baby. That is correct, Bree. Mm-hmm. This film was my sexual awakening. Three dots. Roseanne. <laughs> Roseanne. <laughs> One star. That is a five star. star. Oh my god. Andrew. Yep. Um In Sort Animal Farm. (laughs) What? What does that mean? (laughs) In Sort Animal Farm. Uh, One star. That is a five star Bree! What the fuck does that mean? In Sort Animal Farm. (laughs) Roseanne Bar. Period. Oh, one star. That is correct. Andrew. <laughs> oh, you gave him gave her the easy one. Okay. This shit gave me nightmares as a kid. Um, nightmares as a kid. One star. One star. And finally, Bree. Mm-hmm. This movie made me want to eat beef. Five stars. That is a one, and Andrew wins previews. I am fantastic at previews. Wait, I you won? Know, I don't. I don't eat beef, <laughs> but I know it's good. So that should have been a five stars. Uh, all right. That note, let's go into a mid show. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a sh 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 shill at you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Patreon is this wonderful place where you get to watch us record these episodes live at any level. As well, you get Patreon meetups, you get our episodes a couple days early you get tons of fucking cool shit you get an entire patron podcast and there's me and andrew have some cool plans coming up there um so if you're not on there now you're gonna want to get on there pretty quick because they they they're, they won't be lasting as well we don't bring this up but you get um you get um money off of our merch um you just got to get the code from us so let us know all right, our current donors are, are Melissa Goldman, Danielle Rennox, Justin Tampedio, and Cassidy Meir, Monica Throw, Mina Miniri, Brent Black, Athanasio Stacey Coom, Joseph Evans Green, Mary Lou Choquette, John Finnells, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Kala Summers, Janae C, Scoot the Technicolor, Dreamcoat, Liz Lim, Allison Stuller, Nothing is Certain Except Beth and Taxes, Thesbian, Ren Cullen, Rafael Martinez Salaz, Jessica T, Mitchell Young, Chai Teacup, Katie McDonough, Chris Marco, Mimu Kiji, Kiji Marie Anastasio, Layla, RJ Narija, Car- Charlie B, Bjorn Hermans, Eric As, Toriana Frazier, Sandy the Most Lopez, Lyanna Morton, Angela, Kaylee Blazier, Birdman69, Cinema Again Reviews, Villainous Mist, Sofiana Ali, The Omega Geek, Paige Pearson, Maddie Wargle, Alisa Erdman, Anne Lopes Katova, Cheska Vare, 
Sarah Dan Blecker, Evan Ball, Zachary Torres Spencil, Spencer Hellier, Gavin Carter, Party Before Venturing Forth, and Nicholas Bates. They all give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks, come join us over at Patreon. Also, I want to take this moment to say, on mic, um, thank you, patrons, for helping, along with others, me meet um, my Kickstarter goal. Um, sincerely, it means a lot to me that all of you have done it, as well as Bree. Bree, Bree, I saw that you supported, um, and I need to write you a proper thank you. It means the world to me. Um, it, it really is a humbling experience, and I love all of you very much. All right, let's get back to the show! All right. There's only, like, four songs in this show, so... Yeah, this shouldn't take long. Tell me about them. Let's hear it. Um, You Ain't Home on the Range, which is the opening number. This ain't a home, home, home on the range, home, home, there go get pal, you ain't home on the range, home in the land where the wheat are hard and fronted, out in the land where they shoot the wild and home, home, home on the range, out with a banner, a whole lot better, if you're the type with a nervous bladder, yeah, yeah, your saddle's gone. Yeah, this is just Home on the Range. It's not like just Home edgy. on the Range. It's the edgy version. Because you're not Home on the Range. I feel like this song was written for one of the older versions of the movie where it was supposed to be, like, edgier, you know? So this, so in February of 1998, Alan Menken signed a long-term agreement with Walt Disney Studios to compose songs and or scores for animated and live-action motion pictures. Following this, according to Menken, he was attached to provide music for Sweating Bullets maybe a year and a half after Hercules. Shortly after winning the Richard Rodgers... He brought in Glenn Slater to help work on it. Um, and they wrote the first of the film's six original songs back in 1999, the first of which was Little Patch of Heaven, recorded by Katie Lang before the directors, Finn and Sanford, were even brought on board as directors. The villain song, Yodel Idol 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 O, which incorporates the William Tell Overture and Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the 1812 o Overture into the Yodel Dance, was added following several story changes throughout production. While Randy Quaid, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, oh God. And they, oh God. <laughs> Wait, did... Are you saying Randy Quaid actually did yeah, sing this song? Yeah, he sang much of that song, um, including the consonants heard during the yodels, but vowel sounds in the yodeling were overdubbed by ghost singers Randy Irwin and Carrie Christensen, two world championship yodelers. But here's where we go. Following the September 11th attacks, Mankin composed the song Will the Sun Ever Shine Again in reaction, which was reformed by Ro Bonnie Raitt, um, daughter of John Raitt from uh, Carousel in Oklahoma. Um, the soundtrack album was released in March 30th of 2004, and yeah, five years after all those songs were written. Will the sun ever shine again? Feels like it's been years since it started to thunder. Clouds are camping out in the valley. Will the sun ever shine again? So they put the song that was about mourning 9-11 into their cow movie? Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah. You know, you got to appreciate the balls to do <laughs> something like that. Alan Menken, you know? while being a talented genius, makes some wild choices sometimes. I, I you know, good, good on him. Um, so Little Patch of Heaven. Yeah, I love that, that song. one's like I really like the song. The, it's probably technically the best song because it's like fully original and not um half of the song is their yodeling Beethoven uh <laughs> or William Tell Overture. Everything's green. Know what I mean? Darling, it's quite the sweetest sight that you ever done seen. Ain't nothing much out there. Just life and it's probably the best one i think it's a pretty weak song as far as disney goes though because it's i mean okay all of the songs in this are they're tarzan um nobody actually sings except for alameda slim alameda slim sings he's the only one he yodels yes. pardon me i wouldn't want to offend him <laughs> um <clears throat> but yeah it, it reminds me of the um oh geez i, I wasn't sure what i'm gonna say never mind 
I take it back. Um, I'm going to talk about a little Patch of Heaven. I like it because Katie Lang, I'm just a big Katie Lang fan. And maybe that's just me being a little uh, biased. I just think her voice sounds incredible. I think the song is just yeah. calming. And it's the only one that really sticks with me. Um, as much as I do like the other songs, I am a big fan of Bonnie Raitt. I'm a big fan of like a lot of the other vocalists. This is just the one where I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll think about this one more often. Um, it's the one used in all the trailers. I remember it. Even though I saw the trailer once, I remember that song. In my little patch of heaven way out west. Yeah, this, this one's good. I mean, it's good. Yeah. It's it's like the it's like the theme song of the movie if You Ain't Home on the Range didn't exist. <laughs> um, And it probably should have been because honestly, You Ain't Home on the Range isn't like a great song. No, Little Patch of Heaven is a much better song. Um, Why don't you talk about your favorite song, Randy Quaid singing, Yodel, 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 Yodel. You see my Yodel, Yodel, the sweetest way of rustling the empty vines. Cause when I yodel, it'll little at all. Why, looky how them cows get hypnotized. He don't prod, he don't yell. Still, he drives and doggies well. Which ain't easy when your chaps are labeled XXXXL. Yes, if you're looking from a bovine point of view. This song is just uh, a blast. Um, it's one of the most fun villain songs in any Disney movie. Um, it's the only song in this movie that's actually sung by a character. Um, and it's completely meaningless, which means that they're able to do a Pink Elephants, uh, music video for it. Um, to quote Doug Yancey Walker, is it a big lipped alligator moment? Uh I forget what that means. <laughs> it, something happens and it's never mentioned again, and it's really weird. They definitely mention it again. Yeah. It is kind of plot. So it's not. It is plot centric. Oh, it's plot relevant for sure. It's just Stylized. the lyrics of the song are just like, I just yodel and da 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 da. <laughs> but it's great. And I, I honestly, I kind of love yodeling. It sounds really good. It sounds really goofy and fun. Uh,. <laughs> To, to quote the uh, the one character, yodeling is uh, the goofiest, corniest, uh, cheesiest, <laughs> but yodeling is cheesiest great. thing someone can do. <laughs> I agree. The scene, the animation in that scene is fucking incredible. Oh, yeah. And they allow a Disney villain to, like, look happy, like, jolly, you know, like... Most most Disney villains that have songs, they look like uh, they look like death. You know, the only like, one I can think of that isn't that way is Radigan's song from the Great Mouse Detective, because <laughs> he's a big okay. smiler. I think like Maybe Gaston Star I guess, looks sort of, but he's he still looks like evil. I don't know. And Scar, so, I mean Scar, he literally looks like a Nazi. Like I mean, so are the cows <laughs> in this song, they're goose stepping away. No, they're the cows are just walking with a silly thing on their face, and they're changing colors. They're like rainbow colored, and Slim is just having a grand old time. He's just having fun. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like it. I love it. Um, and for some reason, it was recommended to me on YouTube randomly, which is why we're even doing this episode. Yeah. So let's actually talk about that. You literally say Home on the Range is probably Disney's least funny film funny movie but it's weirdly endearing which i think is yes you're the best review sincerely i think that sums it up very well yeah i mean I, that's how i feel about it it's like i like talking about home on the range i think it's like entertaining to watch but it is completely humorless um and not good so it's it's in a weird place for me um i i think it's in a similar place as like shark tale though because like shark tale is also kind of uh interesting to talk about movie that is just not good <laughs> but i like home on the range more so i i mean let let's look at latter half disney really quick if you don't mind yeah sure like in that time between tarzan and tangled the two t's mm -hmm. let's rank them uh, uh, sure. Oh, we're doing Disney. We're ignoring Pixar. We're ignoring all the other ones. I'm not. Even, let's not even tier them. We're gonna actually rank yeah. them. Yeah. You ready, Andrew? Yeah. Um. So, do, 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 1999. Um. Fantasia 2000. Not a great movie. Not my favorite. Blows. That one's bad. I like moments in it. Uh, I think the highs are very high, but the lows are very low. And the fact that they have people like introduce everything is completely awful as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's near the bottom for sure. What, what else? Dinosaur. Uh, that might be the bottom. That might be the actual bottom. The Emperor's New Groove. Probably the top, near the top. Recess schools out. Mid. Atlantis: The Lost Empire. Mid. Return to Neverland. Never seen it. It's, it's not great. Um, Lilo and Stitch. Near the top. Agreed. Treasure Planet. Near the top but probably not as high as uh, the other two. The Jungle Book 2. Never seen it. Brother Bear. 
mid, but near the bottom of mid. Teacher's Pet. Never seen it. I'd actually put Brother Bear way below this. Um, um, Home on the Range. <sighs> Home on the Range is probably around the same place as Brother Bear. Okay. Um, Valiant. Never seen it. It's a 2005 computer animated film about the carrier pigeons in World War II. Do with that what you want. Chicken Little. <laughs> <laughs> Chick uh bottom near the bottom. I watched it recently that is unwatchably bad. It's terrible. Um and I don't believe it's the director's fault or the animator's fault. I kind of I kind of get a vibe of what happened there. Um The Wild. Uh probably near the bottom but I haven't seen it in a long time so I can't say for sure. Meet the Robinson. Top of mid. I'm actually a pretty big defender of that movie. I think that movie's cute. Uh, it's cute but I don't think it's great. It's not like Lilo and Stitch or Emperor's New Groove where they're like actually good movies. Okay. Okay. Um, Tinkerbell. Never seen it. Bolt. Uh, Bolt is uh, mid, but forgot. It's forgotten mid. No one, no one remembers this movie. Okay. A Christmas Carol. I think I watched that recently. <laughs> We watched that, right? No, I'm talking about the the, the Jim Carrey one. Did we not watch we the Jim Carrey not. one? I thought we, we did. did. Oh, then I guess I've never seen it. The Princess and the Frog. Top. And Tangled. Top. All right. I mean, I still think this is ranking pretty high up there among its contemporaries. Yeah, I mean, there's some shit. This one's just um more interesting than some of the other shitty ones. And it's certainly probably a more fun watch than brother bear brother bear is like depressing it's like it's not fun to it's watch a sad movie <laughs> like oh my god the trauma of your brother's death and yeah. then you go and murder I this bear get... cud's mom and you have to tell it to its face that you murdered its mom yeah and then i always get sad at the end because he doesn't turn back into a human why he stays as a bear i was like why do you turn don't back? don't you want a shortened like, lifespan no i want to why doesn't he want to be with his actual family why does he stay as a bear why does he care about this bear cub so much the bear don't got no mom now because he murdered its mom yeah like it's fucking weird that's fucked up i don't like it <sighs> but the some of some of the music in it is okay though phil phil collins is phil collins in it up you know he he it wasn't phil Co uh, it wasn't good phil collins um on that note i do want to wrap this up but i did want to squeeze this in somewhere but <laughs> i almost didn't make it to this recording session today oh no um what happened? I had a near death ish experience this afternoon. Oh. I was on my bike, and on my left hand side, there was a, a buck, a doe, and a baby deer. And I apparently startled them, and the doe and the baby went off into the woods. But the buck followed me along the fence line, and then found an exit, and then hopped over the fence and started chasing me. And he has like two feet on me, plus fucking giant antlers, and he's just chasing me. Um, with intent to murder, I think. I didn't stop to ask. <laughs> so you almost got killed by a cow. Uh, it, it was a buck. Damn. Yeah. Uh, Home on the Range, <laughs> cursed episode. <laughs> Literally, the characters are coming out of the fucking movie and they're trying to I kill you. I didn't have a good segue into this, <laughs> but I did have a Disney moment. <laughs> Oh my god! Well, and it really—it was right after we hit the Kickstarter goal, so it really humbled me as to what's important. <laughs> the important thing is yeah. not getting killed by a buck. <laughs> how long did he? How long did he follow you? He followed me until he saw like proper cars, and then he kind of just ducked away. Oh, he was coming for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, he—he he was gonna get you. It was fucking terrifying. I don't think I've been that scared. But were you like already kind of tired and you were like, oh, no. you're going to start slowing no, down? No, my bike ride had just started. <laughs> so thankfully I still had. Oh, so you were booking was, it. You were booking it. I was booking it. I actually looked at my heart rate. It was 186. Holy shit. That cow was going to fucking kill your ass. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> And the thing was fast. Like, it going on the fence line was outpacing me by a lot. How did you outrun it? Um, I think I just got to a point where it had been unpleasant for it to go. So I just said, fuck it. Dude, you were fucking, you were <laughs> fucked, dude. Um, don't, don't ride your bike past there ever again. I don't again. think I My will, God. sincerely. I, I think I'm a little, little afraid to ride in that specific area now. To think that we would have had to cancel this episode because you were Because I got gored to death were... by a fucking giant ass. <laughs> fucking antlers deer like imagine that is my death like oh he took on a fucking giant ass like bambi's <laughs> dad murdered him and this this story okay. is brought to you by michigan we got some scary animals yo <laughs> okay um you know who else got scary animals 
We gotta do cheese ratings. We oh, you're right. What is our overall thoughts yeah. on a Home in the Rain and range and our cheese ratings? Andrew, why don't you start? Yeah. Um, I was pretty negative, but honestly, I feel like uh, it kind of deserves it. It's not great. <laughs> Uh, you could tell that this movie went through hell trying to be made. Um, you could just kind of feel it while you're watching it. Um, and sadly, it's just not very funny. At the same time, though, look up the Yodel song. Just look up the Yodel song. It's fucking good. <laughs> it's fucking good. That whole scene is so good. I love when he takes his guitar and he makes it look like a gun and you, like, think he's gonna shoot the cow. It's so good. Um, but everything else in the movie is kind of, uh, mid. Uh, so that's, that's my thought. Um, I'm gonna give it, uh, blue cheese, because, uh, blue cheese is cheesy, but it's kind of covered in mold, um, and so, you know, do you want to eat mold? God, what are you- The answer is you kind of, you kind of do, because blue cheese is good. What are you, Doug Walker? Yeah, but I didn't say anybody was lazy, okay? I don't think anybody was lazy making this movie. I think that they probably <laughs> were overworked, if anything, trying to make this fucking thing happen. <laughs> Man, 2004, as Brie brought up, was a good year for animated films um, outside of this. Um, the Polar Express, Shark Tales, The Incredibles, the SpongeBob movie, Shrek 2. Lion King one and a half. Lion King one and a half. Lots of Scooby-Doo movies. I feel like there's like 900 Scooby-Doo movies a year. Yeah, I, love, I think three might have came out in 2004. So The Incredibles is great. Oh, yeah. SpongeBob movie. Um, I have a soft a spot for it. The Garfield movie also came out this year. Yeah, a lot of good movies came out in 2004. Tale of Two Kitties came no, out. No, 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 that was Mentalator. Well. Fat Albert the movie, there's a little bit of animation in that one. Fun fact, that is the first movie my dad ever said, I wish that I could erase it from my brain and I regret having kids because of it. That movie? Fat Albert, yes. Really? I have never heard much about that movie, so I guess I didn't know it was bad. I watched it recently. It's not that terrible. Um, Kill Bosby's not great in it, but... Well, yeah, but he's, I mean, he's America's dad, right? I didn't know there was a Mulan 2, but that... That does... That, that does exist. Um, it is not good. Um, Bree, what is your thoughts on our discussion? What do you, how do you even continue? Um, you know, wedding. They got to plan a wedding. Huh, yeah. That's what Mulan was all about. She's a girl and she wants to get married. Girls love getting married. Mulan was all about feminine uh, roles and falling into them. Bree, what is your thoughts on our discussion and your cheese rating? Uh, your discussion was great. Yeah, I applaud you for even talking about this. Um. <laughs> What? We talked I, about it longer than the movie lasts at this we, point. We so. did. True. Um, I don't remember this movie. I did, you know, I was nine years old. If I watched it, it's suppressed by t childhood trauma. Um, and I don't think I would recommend anybody else go watch it. But I'm going to play my cheese as a song because I don't have a cheese to, to give it this week. So let me share my screen. <laughs> You know, for me, the biggest adventure of all is always the annual family summer vacation. Where you pack up the car, pull out the map, and head for those places that are tranquil, quiet, and untouched by the screaming masses. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is hide a discouraging white, and the sky is not cloudy all day. Chuck E. Cheese's TV, 56 subscribers. I admit, I know it's for a good reason. However, I do sincerely miss when anyone could comment on children's m media. I'm gl- Oh, yeah. Because you'd find the wildest fucking comments on them. They should just allow you to upload them as adult content, so just so you can do that. Yeah, comments. but then kids will- Stumble across adults saying the F word and then cry themselves to sleep and shit their pants. But they're or... going to cry themselves to sleep and shit their pants regardless of what they see on the internet. <laughs> you you make good it's points, true. Andrew. <laughs> so that song is Bree's cheese rating. Yep. I think the cheese rating would be Chuck E. Cheese, right? Yeah, it'd be Chuck E. Where cheese. Where a kid can be... That's Which nice. honestly, that's a, that's a fitting cheese rating for Home on the Range. It is, it is yeah. that level of like shitty fucking for kids awful media. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. It was on that note. My cheese rating is I kind of liked it. I I, I really ex didn't expect to like this that much, and I enjoyed it. I had a good time. It's a short, easy watch with pretty visuals. <laughs> Jess is easily entertained. I really am. I, I was in a little bit of a dark place for most of October, um, and it was really a nice, comforting... He went to Massachusetts. 
<laughs> the spirit of Massachusetts is the spirit of America, the spirit of what's red and what's blue. Oh, the Family Guy song that they did in full because it was in a commercial for Massachusetts. Um, But I am giving this mom's cheese pie. Mom's savory cheese pie. Sounds good. Because it's a little slice of him and bye. You know, like the Katie Lane song. Mm -hmm. Fuck y'all people. All right. This sh- thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Instagram, Musicals with Cheese, Patreon, Musicals with Cheese, YouTube page, Musicals with Cheese. We have a patron-only podcast called Patreon with Cheese. Email us at musical theater lives at gmail.com our keeper of the cheese is juliet antonio there's some asmr for you <laughs> good luck writing our cheese ratings this time this show is produced by the incredible the wonderful one of my favorite human beings in the world with wonderful hair today brianna jones thank you thank our you. theme songs were created by robin nash of iou music uk thank you to the broadway podcast network for having us on the platform and for not kicking us off because we plan to have a bunch of cattle raid the capital all right guys bunch of bunch of hogs raiding the capital let's go <laughs> anything else we have left to say um before we wrap this up uh, the t- the tagline for this movie was bust a moo. So I'm surprised you didn't say that once in this episode. I didn't, I didn't know that. I would have been saying it at all times. <laughs> bust a moo. On April 2nd, bust a moo. You know what? And they wonder why everyone thought this movie sucked. <laughs> that was the tagline? Nobody even watched this shit. They're just like, bust a moo. That looks like the worst piece of shit I've ever seen in my fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> on that note we can't take the kids to see this they're talking about busting busting makes me feel good busting 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 makes me feel good bust a moo we'll see you next time <laughs> on musicals with cheese I know a place, pretty as pie, out where the river band hits up with the end of the sky. It's left Nebraska over the crest on a little patch of heaven way out west.